The U.S. Supreme Court has been hearing a variety of cases this session, and depending on how they rule, some very partisan and controversial policies could change. As a class this semester, the students of Watching Washington have been discussing the major cases on the high court's docket. A few of them join me now to discuss the issues. First, let's talk about the one that affects college students and grads anywhere, student loan forgiveness. So the first question in this case is whether President Biden had permission to forgive um, those student loans. The definition of waive and modify is at question here. And this started back after 9-11 when Congress gave the power that in a national emergency, student loan borrowers would not be economically hammered and could be forgive of their loans, waived of their loans for that time. So both Trump and Biden invoked that law. And this came um, for Biden by pressure in his own party to go further with canceling and forgiving this debt. So do you guys think waive or modify can go as far as forgive? Or do you have a broader opinion on the case? I think that's a really great question. And um, as this pandemic comes to a close and uh, we will resume normal uh, operations within the United States as uh, similar to what we've been experiencing over the past few months, uh, it does raise the question as we there um, students essentially deserve to be forgiven of these debts in full now that the repercussions um, of the pandemic are dying down and um, America is moving into a new chapter. Personally, I don't believe that um, these debts should be forgiven um, after uh, this, this COVID pandemic and this period. Um, I think there is a major difference between the idea of waiving loans um, and suspending them for a certain amount of time um, to then be paid later, which has been um, Biden's policy and his administration's policy so far. Um, but I think going so, so far as to forgive um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars in student loans um, post hoc after the fact uh, would not be um, the greatest use of uh, American taxpayer money um, or abiding by the statutes as described um, uh, by you earlier. Mm -hmm. I do think though, if we're gonna go off strict definitions, um, the wave and modify, um, I could see an argument being made that that could be extended to forgiveness, um, combining both the waiving and the modifying and um, seeing how that goes more long-term, maybe not fully long-term, um, maybe focusing more on the timing of, you know, students going into college like during the pandemic or, you know, people not being, being out of a job during the pandemic, not able to um, keep up with these loans, but maybe not as, as long-term as like fully forgiving for forever. But for right now, yeah, I could see that. Yeah, and the extension of emergency powers in a lot of capacities has been a topic of debate for many years. We just saw this week with the AUMF being repealed for emergency war power. So mm -hmm. it's definitely a sticky subject that will have consequences if the Supreme Court does rule on it. Um, but one of the sticking points here is whether or not the six state objectors have legal standing to challenge the student loan forgiveness plan at all. Because if they can't show they've suffered a concrete harm, they have no right to sue. So right now, um, the states have hung up their argument on a claim that the plan could end up depriving the state of Missouri revenue from the Missouri Higher Education Loan Authority, which is an independent corporation. And so there's questions of why is the state suing on behalf of the organization? Um, and does that affect the outcome? Can it even stand before um, the Supreme Court when no harm has been suffered yet? Yeah, I think that gets really sticky with, um, I think it's quite weird um, that they're not involved with the with the process, with the um, case, like the, how do you say it again, Mohila? Mohila, yeah. Mohila, yeah. Um, and I wonder if they had the opportunity for their approach to be involved, if they mm -hmm. declined, and what the reasoning behind that was. Um, I just, I don't know, it's a weird point to me. Yeah. I wish I could learn more about that too. Yeah, and I also think the fact that he had like, or you know, supposedly had that emergency power to enact something like this may have been the, the case of why they weren't involved in the process. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, definitely as someone who is a loan borrower, like having that, um, you know, not necessarily forgiveness, but a wave or modifying of, you know, what m me or my family would have to pay is something that's like pretty relevant and important for us. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of, for a lot of families who are low income or um, middle class, like having that, um, that wave could be very important for them financially, um, especially with the job market now and, um, a, you know, a multitude of different like financial struggles that people have gone through th through mm -hmm. during COVID um, is definitely very important. But so yeah, let's absolutely. move on next um, to social media. One of the other topics before the Supreme Court 
is cases of internet companies and immunity from what they put on their platform. So one mm -hmm. of the specific cases um, we've talked about on our show, but according to NPR, um, this case before the Supreme Court is about the Gonzalez family and families of other terrorism victims are suing Google, Twitter, Facebook, other companies under the Anti-Terrorism Act, which specifically allows civil damage claims for aiding and abetting terrorism. So the families are alleging that these companies did more than just simply recommend ISIS videos um, to those who may be interested, that they were seeking to do this to get more viewers and increase ad revenue. And it just raises a really broad question um, of should internet companies be liable for what is on their platform? And this mm -hmm. is a very sensitive topic as well with terrorism to talk about and could lead to a long stream of precedent. Okay, so um, I am an international student from China. And in our country, it's a very different case. I can say that we have, it's a two-polar. Because in our country, I think almost like government controls everything of our social medias. And even they block the curse words. So, uh, and I think in my opinion, this is their way to like control the terrorist room. But I'm wondering, what is the, like a, appropriate boundary for mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. according to this case. And as I said, it's too polar. And it yeah. can go t into like two very different ways. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, especially as like social media becomes more relevant with, um, especially in relation to freedom of speech mm -hmm. and um, you know what people can post and what people can say on these social media platforms, um, and especially, you know, I know during COVID, like Twitter was having issues with the COVID inf misinformation and some people were bothered that those, you know, those notifications were coming up because they felt like they had the right to speak on the matter, despite mm -hmm. maybe not being like professionally um, or have like that educated background. But um, especially in this case, I mean, obviously morally, no one would want terrorists to have a platform where they would be able to, you know, um, spread this, mm -hmm. their information or, you know, be able to garner more attention for mm -hmm. themselves. No one would want that. Um, but as a platform, it kind of, yeah, it begs the question of like, how, what can you ban on a platform and how would you be able to monitor it for not just those, you know, out of the U.S. who are using the platform, but people who are using it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of even goes into other social media platforms like TikTok recently, so. Mm -hmm. I think you, you both bring up a ton of really good points in that this idea, this question of where that line should be drawn for social media companies in terms of their responsibility um, for places like ISIS um, and um, different groups that want to create harm um, and uh, perform acts of terrorism through the internet. Um, as defined by the uh, Communications Decency Act of 1996, social media companies as of right now and internet companies as a whole are not currently liable for individual third-party posts made by users of their platforms. Uh, this case, Google versus Gonzalez, challenges that very notion of responsibility. And if upended, it could lead to a, a whole plethora uh, of changes um, and an opening of a Pandora's box, um, mm -hmm. if you will, of, of the internet, of liability, um, and of legal cases against a lot of these big social media internet companies if they are liable um, in the future. So I, I think it's going to be a very um, testy case in, in the months to come. Mm -hmm. I know final ruling is, is um, to be decided sometime in the summer and around June. Um, but until then, I think on both sides of the aisle, we'll see a lot of um, challenges, a lot of remarks, and arguments made um, for and against uh, this act. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I do think, too, like, um, we would be remiss to not bring up the amazing things that have happened through communication on these platforms as well. I mean, you know, entire groups of people have been liberated from, like, being able to communicate uh, through these platforms. Um, so we have, like, these two extremes. So right now, like, you know, Terrorism is an extreme um, mm -hmm. of like no one wants that to be happening, but you also can't forget the good things that have come out of these things. And if you're going to start limiting one group of <coughs> one group of people, then it could go another way too. Because I'm sure there are a bunch of people who wouldn't have wanted those people to find each other. And once you like we're getting liberated and like finding community, mm -hmm. I'm sure people don't want that to happen either. So it goes both ways. Yeah, I really appreciate right. Joyce bringing in her perspective too, just to show that it's really hard because then if these social media companies are held liable, they're going to have to start drawing a line for themselves. Well, who in their company mm -hmm. is drawing that line? And who's to mm -hmm. say that this could lead to terrorism, but this couldn't lead to terrorism? And 
it just, like you said, opens a huge Pandora's box. So it'll be yeah. interesting to watch over the next few months for sure. But let's move on to a little more lighthearted Supreme Court case, mm -hmm. if there can be such a case, <laughs> about bad, stan bad spaniels. Now, we talked about this on Watching Washington, um, but the story is here that the Supreme Court is hearing an argument um, from a famous whiskey company, Jack Daniels, which is attempting to stop the production of a dog toy named Bad Spaniels. Uh, the whiskey company is claiming that the toy violates trademark being shaped like the bottle and mimicking a bottle of Jack Daniels. And VIP has a simple stance on their matter um, with this quote, freedom of speech begins with freedom to mock. So do you guys have any opinion <coughs> on this case or are you enjoying just watching it unfold and seeing what the <laughs> outcome will be? I think it's kind of funny that, I mean, I didn't know that it was a Supreme Court case before we covered it on the show. And um, I, it's just, it's so interesting to see, you know, obviously Jack Daniels is like this huge entity and they are, you know, essentially targeting this like small um, or dog toy <laughs> company, but um, which I'm sure, you know, the dog toy company is just trying to have some fun. So I feel like they're taking it like so seriously. Of course, I don't know like trademark and copyright, you know, violations <laughs> and everything, but um, just seems like something that, you know, no one really would care about. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it kind of looks bad on Jack Daniels too. Of like, <laughs> learn how to take a joke. I don't know. I, I <laughs> yeah. love. I love when companies like um, the Wendy's Twitter and stuff mm -hmm. like are like you know really involved with um, just making fun of themselves and like taking light of things. Um, I wish they would have taken a different perspective on this case instead of taking it to the Supreme Court. But <laughs> and it makes you think like Jack Daniels. They they must be all alone in this like pursuit. Like right. The, there's been a ton of companies that have been mocked before by by other places, but. Um, as this case has evolved, it's, it's been crazy to see that other huge brands such as Patagonia and Nike have come to support Jack Daniels in their pursuit of, mm -hmm. of um, defending their copyright um, mm -hmm. responsibilities and rights that they have. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how um, this company Bad Spaniels continues, or, or the company that is making this Bad Spaniels product continues to um, fight their case. A commonly used test that's used to determine whether um, the products are confused, right? If these copyright infringements really are taking place, is, is this called Rogers test um, that essentially allows consumers to evaluate if they are confusing um, the parody or mocking product compared to the actual product, in this case, the Bad Spaniels mm -hmm. dog toy compared to the Jack Daniels <laughs> bottle of whiskey. Um, <laughs> as of now, there have been no conclusions drawn that consumers are um, confusing these two things, um, which obviously is not. Um, the greatest for Jack Daniels, who is making this case mm -hmm. that it is infringing on their mm -hmm. copyright. So uh, I, I think it's in some sense a battle between these huge brands who want to protect their, their copyrights and these smaller uh, brands that are just trying to, to get a kick and um, yeah, you know, yeah. find a product that <laughs> consumers enjoy. Yeah. You also mm -hmm. wonder too, like, this is bringing more light to it than like, I'm sure no one would have even noticed if it wouldn't have become a case. So yeah. I think that's kind of funny mm -hmm. that they're even bring you more attention to the situation. Yeah, hey, any, they say any PR is good PR, yeah. maybe, <laughs> maybe. I don't know if that's true, but let's round it out finally with our last case we're gonna talk about today, which deals with the First Amendment. And I mean, that was what we were talking about with social media as well. Mm -hmm. What is that line? So in this case, we have Hellman Hansen, we talked about this on Watching Washington, this show actually, um, who cons non-citizens into believing they could obtain US citizenship through adult adoption. Now. He's been charged um, with that mail and wire fraud already for that, but it also found him guilty on two counts of encouraging or inducing these non-citizens to remain in the United States. And these two counts are the focus of the argument before the Supreme Court. So the question really is here, is encouraging or inducing immigrants to stay in the country free speech or a crime? Um, and really just would lead to a broader precedent in cases as far as can someone encourage or induce someone against obeying rules for wearing a mask in vaccines, parking violations, and mm -hmm. things like that as well. I think that's a hard one. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure for the non-citizens, like them finding out that they, um, I'm they wouldn't become citizens, is that, what's yeah. that, is that what was happening? Um, I think for them that probably wasn't um, the best situation to be in. And, but with freedom of speech, it kind of, there's just like so much vagueness, and especially with these cases, it's like we don't have a clear definition or like a clear boundary of what free speech is and like whether the encouraging or inducing is within that boundary. And so that kind of um, can make it confusing. And honestly, I don't have like a clear answer or an mm -hmm. opinion, but it's, it's yeah. interesting. I don't, I don't know. Yes, it is. Because as a foreigner, 
like I know like not a lot of my uh, lots of, lots of my friends they are immigrants. They're here for like better opportunities and they're here for like more money cuz they are more like mm -hmm. I don't know here. And also I know like because I, uh, I have my high school in Arizona, and I know like lots of my high school mates, they're not, um, like they're, yeah, they're just um, illegal uh, mm -hmm. immigrants. And so for me, I think um, as a foreigner, it's a better opportunity to mm -hmm. keep mm -hmm, this, yeah. Because yeah. like yeah. he's taking advantage of like a really vulnerable mm -hmm. group of people. Mm -hmm. So like he's really preying on you know, all these hopes and dreams and aspirations, yeah, yeah. and he's just taking it and like warping that entirely. So I think I, I entirely agree that like, I think it's a really, really bad thing to do um, and with no moral integrity, but the question of like the lawfulness of it, that's where I really yeah. get held up because I'm not for sure if there's a case yeah. for that. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I feel like my like moral compass says that's <laughs> like an awful thing to do, but yeah. legally like I don't, I don't know where the boundary or the line is drawn um, mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. we would be able to identify or define whether or not it's free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and again, like many of these other cases, it's, um, the Supreme Court essentially is trying to figure out where are they going to set this precedent for, mm -hmm. for future cases. Mm -hmm. Similar to our last um, court case we talked about, we th it is the, the um, infringements and copyright issues between Bad Spaniels and Jack Daniels or um, the Communications Decency Act. Uh, setting the, the Supreme Court setting these precedents determines how future instances are going to be interpreted and, and carried out by the law in the future. So mm -hmm. um, as we discussed in our class earlier this semester, the job of the Supreme Court is to um, interpret the Constitution and come up with that, that conclusion um, the best they can. So I think this is another case that's going to be very complex and mm -hmm. um, raise a lot of um, strong arguments on both sides of the aisle um, for the months to come. Certainly. Yeah. Well, thank you all for being here and sharing your thoughts today. It was certainly enlightening, and we look forward to seeing what the Supreme Court comes out with this year. We'll leave it here today as we're running out of time, but thank you all, and we will see you next week on Watching Washington. Have a great day.